Another quarter comes to a close, another quarterly wrap up is due. So here I am to wrap up what I read in quarter two, which is April, May, and June. I uh, I don't have physical copies of all the books that I read. I don't remember what all the books are that I read. I don't know how many books I read. I think it was like 13, 14, 15, something like that. 13 books. Yeah, I'm just gonna go off Goodreads. I, the ones that I have physical copies of, I have those stacked. So as we get to them, I will, I'll hold up the physical book just for the aesthetic of it. The first book that I read this quarter was a reread, the eighth time that I've read this book, and that is The Wolf by Leo Carew. I guess if you're brand new to my channel, then hi, hello, welcome. Um, I've read this book eight times now. Um, this book is the first book in the Under the Northern Sky series, which, spoiler alert, the other two books are also in this quarter because I did a read-along with my patrons. That was like our book club book for three consecutive months. But I've read the first one the most, partly by accident, partly on purpose. What this series is, is it's an alternate history. So it's fantasy, or I should say it's not fantasy, it's speculative fiction. Because our real world history is different from what is in this book, but there's no like wizards. There's no none of that. Like it's just our own real world in like an alternate timeline. So if more than one humanoid species had survived the Ice Age and we had to share the planet. So it wasn't just Homo sapien, that Neanderthal and other humanoids also survived to form language and culture. And so this takes place in like an alternate equivalent, I guess, to the Middle Ages, though of course the trajectory of history is different. So like what time period this takes place in, you know, it's an alternate timeline. But like it has the vibe of like medieval-ish times in terms of level of technology. We largely follow the Anakim, which are these developed Neanderthals, um, but we also have like the human side of things and how there's like politics and battle across the map of Europe in this alternate timeline. And the reason I love this series so much, or one of the reasons that I love this series so much, is that it is intensely anthropological. The author studied biological anthropology. I studied primarily cultural anthropology, but a bit of biological anthropology. That really comes through in these books. Like if that's something that you have a background in or an interest in or any knowledge of, that is like patently obvious. Like when I first read this, I was like, hey, this, he's got to have studied anthropology, right? And then I looked him up and sure enough, he had. <laughs> and if that's not an interest to you, or if that's not something that you know anything about, then I think a lot of people have enjoyed these books who don't have that background and just as kind of like a political war fantasy type of story, you know, because it's got good battle, good politics, etc. Just, you know, a good yarn. But that's the thing that like elevates it above everything else for me. That's the reason I read it eight times, because in addition to being, you know, just a good read with a good story and good characters, good politics, good battle, etc. It has all that going for it, which is already going to make it a, a book series that I like. Then it also has this anthropology element that is just chef's kiss. So um, I never get tired of it. I'll probably read it eight more times and be just as jazzed about it every time. The next book that I read was, oh god, The Passage by Justin Cronin, which I read, I started reading this not, I don't think right when it came out, but pretty close to when it came out. 2010. Okay, yeah, it was after it came out. A few years after it came out. I, I want to say I first started reading this in like 2015, 2016, something like that. So like more close to like when it actually came out. And at the time I was not a booktuber or bookstagrammer or anything like booktornet related. I was just a person who sometimes read books. <laughs> and this had come across my radar and it looked like decently interesting. And I started reading it and I loved the beginning of it. I was immediately hooked and I was really enjoying it. And then, you know, I didn't, DNF was not a part of my vocabulary then, um, but I did like DNF it, but kind of like on accident. I just, it like no longer held my interest and I didn't like mean to stop reading it. I just kind of stopped reading it and never continued. And like, you know, li life moved on and I was like, oh yeah, that book. So I, on and off when I've like been reminded of its existence, been like, oh, now that I'm like a reader, you know, now that I like push through books more and, you know, whatever, like review books, like maybe I should give it another go. And so I knew I had to start from the beginning again because it had been a really long time. So I got on audio this time um, and I started listening to it and I was like, this was so good. Like, oh yeah, I remember like, why, why did I stop reading this? This is so good. And then I hit the point approximately where I stopped last time and was like, oh, yeah, that's why I stopped. <laughs> So without spoilers, um, the setup of this is like to begin with, um, the first like part of the book, 
Um, we're in like the present day, vaguely, whenever that is. And there's like scientific like research about like um this remote place where this like disease has like affected people in a kind of way that we're interested in. And so like we have like multiple perspectives in the beginning, but it's kind of like research is being done on this disease while simultaneously like we've got this like plot line going with this little girl and her mom and like this little girl um, and her mom are kind of on the struggle. And then this guy who's like also kind of struggling with his personal life. And then he uh, like, and the girls crap, Pat's crap. Like there's like lots of kind of different things going on that are all really interesting and very well executed and very like kept me hooked and wanting to see where this was gonna go and had quite high stakes. And I was immediately invested in all the characters. And then when we end, reach the, I think it's the end of part one. If it's not, then it's like the end of part two or something. I think it's the end of part one. Um, when after the end of part one, we do this massive time skip and we're no longer following like any of the people that we were following in part one. We get a whole new cast of characters and like a whole lot more characters. It's not just new characters. There's just like a buttload more characters than there ever were before that we're all supposed to care about now even though like I was invested in the characters we had before, I was here for them. We're not doing them anymore. We're doing all of these other people that like I can't tell apart. And that's what the whole rest of the book is. And it devolves into kind of this like cliche soap opera, like survival story that gets more and more ridiculous as it goes. And I do not care about any of the characters at any point, even though like um, by the end, you have spent more pages with those new characters than you did with the original characters. At no point did I become invested in them. At no point did I care about them. There were still too many of them. I still couldn't tell them apart. And like, again, it literally devolves into like soap opera like kind of shenanigans. Like that's the level of what we're doing, like in terms of like the character interactions. And I'm like, am I supposed to care about this? Am I supposed to be like rooting for this? I do not. Um, there's some like explicit stuff, there's some like quite gruesome violent things that happen, but it just gets really ridiculous. And then there's like this like quasi-religious element to it that really comes to the forefront towards the end of the book that I was just like not on board for at all. And so like the beginning of this book, part one, both times that I read it, you know, 10 out of 10, if I was rating it based on that, like five stars, but then the whole rest of the book, like two thirds easily, is so long and awful to get through. So like overall the book gets like, I don't know what I rated it. Maybe I gave it three stars on the basis of the beginning being so good, but I want to say like two stars. What did I rate it? I gave it three. Okay, I was being kind. Cause the beginning seriously is very good. But yeah, it's like two and a half, I guess, rounded up to a three. Um, and there's two more books. And I'm just like, Jesus Christ, like, no. no, I'm super done. So I don't recommend this. I, mean, I recommend you read the beginning and then stop. Because <laughs> the beginning is genuinely very good. <laughs> okay, the next book that I read was Calamity by Constance Fay. This was for Blades and Bodice Rippers. I did not choose this. Our theme this year is 2020 forward. So we're all doing kind of like sci-fi, futuristic, timey-wimey, you know, however we choose to interpret it. Um, Amanda chose Calamity. Um, it is like, I think considered sci-fi romance. Mo I don't really remember any specifics about this. I remember disliking it intensely and finding it absurd, but truly I cannot remember anything specific about it. I am trying to remember so hard right now. Um, I remember, oh yeah, I remember the sex being like out of nowhere and very like, like I, that's not a thing that I like seek out in books anyway. So like, I'm not the target audience for that, but like there's books where like, I don't mind it. Um, I definitely minded it in this book. Like I, this is this is what's coming back to me is me telling the ladies in Blades and Bodice Rippers that when I was listening to the audiobook on the way to work, like when I would get to those scenes, those scenes came in so fast. It wasn't like built up to, it wasn't like, oh, the tension, like, oh, where it's clearly, lead. it would just like happen. And I was like, are we doing this? And then like the way it was, I was just like making the worst faces as I was like listening to it in the car on the way to work and then like trying to have a normal day at work. Cause I was just like, what? What are we doing? Yeah, and then the plot, what plot there was, was not good. So yeah, that was like zero out of five. Do not recommend. Um, like even in like a schlocky campy, this is, I'm not the target audience. I could see why someone would like this kind of thing. Like I wouldn't even say that. Like for, um, what is it? The blue alien one that I read that I, you know, I'm not the target audience for, uh, Ice Planet Barbarians. Um, and then when Mara made me read or made us read Morning Glory Milking Farm. Again, I'm not the target audience for these books. 
But I will say for them, like the people that they that are the target audience for them, like I can understand in like a your culture is not my culture kind of way, like what is people are getting out of it or what the appeal of that could be. A calamity? I don't think it's good. I think it's terrible. I don't think anyone who that is the target audience for it would enjoy it. Like I'm sure somebody has given it five stars. Like let's go look. I, mean, I gave it one. Surprise, surprise. Uh, yeah, and even Mara and Bethany didn't like it very much. So like I feel vindicated by that. But yeah, there's you know five star reviews. Oh yeah, I remember it being so forced the like the calamityness, like forcing that name in there. Oh yeah, it's coming back to me a little bit. Oh no, it was terrible. But yeah, okay, so I guess uh, there are people exist who liked this. Um, but yeah, it's it's not good. It's not good. Then for um, my patrons, they chose for me to read and vlog for them. Um, the first book in the Southern Reach trilogy, I have a bind up, so I didn't read all this. I read the first book, which is Annihilation. And Annihilation is quite short. It's like, like a, the other two books are clearly longer, a lot longer. I haven't read those, but I kind of want to. That's how long Annihilation is. So it's very short. And I really enjoyed Annihilation, the book. Um, in that vlog, I decided like as a bonus to also watch the movie Annihilation, um, which is supposedly an adaptation of the book Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer. And that movie was one of the worst movies that I've ever seen in my entire life. Like not even from like a, wow, they changed the book so much and I'm a lover of the book, how dare they? Like I quite liked the book and I re I already thought the book would make for a good film. Like it's it, seem it seemed like it would lend itself to that. And like, the movie, even if I hadn't read the book, I would think was terrible. And then having read the book, I was like, Jeff Vandermeer, um, I wonder how he feels about this. Like literally in the credits rolled, they're like, based on the novel by Jeff Vandermeer. I was like, was it though? It's hard to explain the concept of Annihilation um, just generally and then also especially without spoilers. Um, but even if I was to like to be permitted to speak with spoilers, it would still be difficult to explain. But so this is the this bind up, you know, is the Southern Reach trilogy, Area X. And so like Annihilation, the first book, um, the these researchers, these um, this team of like scientists, they go to Area X. And what's really effective about how the book is written, which the movie does not do at all, is that you don't have context. So when you are introduced to the situation where these researchers are going to Area X, all you have to go off of is like the perspective of the like the narrator of the story and her kind of conveying to you how much she knows about it. And part of the, the, set the setup is that the researchers, they don't know, or that what they did know has been like wiped because like for security or like they don't actually even know necessarily why it's been wiped, but like that it had to be wiped. So everyone who's there, including our narrator, is kind of in the dark about like why they're there or how they got there. Cause that was like a necessary part of like going on this expedition was that you had to like be let, like uh give permission to like not know or like you know I'm not expressing that well you had like they like signed on knowing that they would have like memories wiped or that they would not be told things or whatever so they show up and like they're telling us things as they find them or the narrator is telling us things as she finds them and as she encountered them but it is also told like in retrospect so some of it is like at the time this seemed whatever or at the time I thought nothing of it or whatever um which can let you know leads um the narrator, I guess, does know more than she's letting on. She's telling you how she, how she perceived things based on not knowing things at the time. And um, yeah, it just kind of goes from there. And it's a quite like, um, like it is a little bit creepy and dark, but in mostly because like you don't know what's going on and neither does the narrator. And so as things are kind of like unfolding, even kind of very mundane things or mundane conversations, like they take on a sinister um, cast because you don't know and you don't know how much other people know and you're figuring it out and they're figuring it out and you're not sure what is like a lie or you know whatever and then just the mystery of um, the area x itself so you already know there's something not normal about this place anyway and then the added lack of normalcy of you not actually knowing how you got there things like that so like i think it's the atmosphere is done very effectively and the kind of like mystery that you're piecing together with the narrator of like, where are we? How did we get here? Why are we here? What are we researching? What is the point of this research? And like, what makes Area X different? Like, what is it that we're trying to investigate here? Um, both how it's manifesting and then what we're doing about trying to figure it out. So I think it's done very well and it's very atmospheric. And I think you could easily do a movie where you start with no context, where you like show up at Area X, you know, the film starts, you know, kind of in media res and you go from there. And it's kind of how I pictured it going. It does not do that. And like, that is not the only thing it changes. The movie 
takes things in a bizarre direction that is so stupid <laughs> is the only it's it's horrific the movie is is really off-putting to watch it's like really gross like body horror and that has like nothing to do with what actually happens in the book and then it's also really stupid so it's like i feel disgusted and horrified for something dumb you know if i'm gonna be disgusted and horrified let it be for like uh, a worthwhile story where it's like oh man that was like hard to get through but like so worth it because the story's so good but the film annihilation was like horrifying to watch to no to no purpose it was just stupid and it got stupider and stupider as it went while also getting more horrifying as it went and i was just like what is this so anyway the book i would recommend never watch the movie if you haven't seen it don't which is unfortunate because i do think the book would make a good movie but like they're not gonna redo it now so that's unfortunate but yeah book was good and like i said i would like to read um books two and three authority and acceptance and also I'm not saying why, but like the book, it you come to understand in the book why it's called Annihilation. Like that becomes very clear. And in the movie, I mean, the, the, the plot has changed dramatically. So they kind of try to go for that as well, but like it doesn't work and it, it's not the same and it's much stupider. So anyway, <laughs> that's an aside. But yeah, I would recommend Annihilation the book not the movie never the movie okay next i read the spider by leo carew which is the second book in the other the northern sky series which is amazing i read this one now three times i think i think it's three times maybe four but i'm pretty sure it's three i could check but i'm not gonna in many ways this is better than the wolf but yeah i mean it's it's more world building more exploration of like this concept there are more kind of like um there's another type of humanoid that gets introduced and explored like you hear about them in book one but you really get to see them in book two which is really interesting the politics and everything and the war and the just general plot is also like everything's escalating in book two and yeah it's fantastic and if you're into the what i've described it as being then i highly recommend it but like if you don't care about anthropology you'll probably think it's mid and you're wrong but it's fine next i read also with my patrons no don't fall down um my patrons and i are reading the wizard knight by gene wolf so this is a bind up um the wiz the wizard knight is actually it's weird that it's called that because it's actually the knight and the wizard so it's just the two books. So the next book I read was The Night, which is part one. And I'm currently reading The Wizard. Um, but it's not part of this wrap up because I will be finishing it in July. And yeah, it's a duology by Gene Wolfe. <laughs> and Gene Wolfe is the author of Book of the New Sun, which I talked about and read with my patients as well. And I can't say very much about it because one, it's Gene Wolfe. Two, I haven't finished part two. And I feel like you don't really know what a Gene Wolfe story is about until you've come to the end, whether that be the end of a book or the end of a series. So like, I'm kind of in the dark still about like what any of this means. <laughs> but it's a good place to be with Gene Wolfe. This is a kind of like Arthurian slash Norse slash like portal fantasy sci-fi weirdness it says the wizard knight is, is in the rare company of uh works of fantasy like once and future king or wizard of earth sea that drink directly from the wellspring of myth yeah so like i guess the initial setup is like our our narrator that this is a gene wolf book so like the narrator's pretty unreliable and i don't fully yet know how unreliable because i haven't finished part two they are seemingly from a world that is either our own or like similar to our own in terms of how he describes it is originally from there but this book takes place in a different world and all the names are like slightly off but like they're very similar to like names from norse mythology so like ostensibly it takes place in like midgard and then like there's other levels of like that are reminiscent of like what you find in norse mythology of like you know where the gods are and we're on midgard you know the mortal plane etc but like the mythology that's going on here like while it does draw from norse it also draws from like 50 other things and also Gene Wolfe's own mind. So it's like a big old mishmash of things that is strange and complex and obfuscated. But yeah, so we follow our narrator as he's traversing this 
fantasy landscape. It's kind of got like, you know, a hero's journey quest type of vibe to it. But none of that is like actually describing the experience of reading it because most of the experience of reading it is like bewilderment because it's Gene Wolfe. There's a lot going on with it. And a lot of it is just kind of like trying to piece together what he's actually getting at or what might be, what he might mean by things or what is actually going on. Again, I haven't read part two yet or I haven't finished part two yet. So I don't fully know where this is going or what it all means. I don't know that I will know that at the end. <laughs> But we'll see. But I did enjoy it. And so far, I would say I recommend it. I don't, again, I don't know if we like sticks the landing, but I'm certainly extremely intrigued. And we spent a great deal of time talking about part one, you know, kind of like throwing out theories and being like, wouldn't it be crazy if, but it's Gene Wolfe. So like, it's not even crazy <laughs> to say it might be this. Um, so I'm excited to see kind of like where, where we land when we finish part two. But yeah, I am enjoying. Uh, next, I also read from my patrons. Um, they chose it for me to vlog for them. Uh, Dolores Claiborne by Stephen King, which uh, yeah, obviously I'd never read before. I had never heard of it before either. And I don't know if it's like extremely well known and it's like weird that I haven't heard of it, but I had literally never heard of it. Um, so I knew absolutely nothing about it. So it was a really fun vlog for me because it is so rare to actually pick up a book that you genuinely know nothing about. The only thing I knew was that Stephen King wrote it because like that's what I said on the cover of the book. <laughs> Most of the time, even if you avoid spoilers, like you've picked up a book because something about it interested you, like, you know, like either the type of like genre that it is or some trope that's in it or something to truly go in blind. Like, you know, you're not gonna be picking up a book for no reason usually. So like the fact that, you know, they chose it for me, but I was truly blind was like just a fun experience to be like, I don't know what this is. I have literally no idea what this is. Um, because, you know, Stephen King also writes such varied things. So because it was Stephen King and I didn't know anything about it, then I kept waiting. I was like, is it going to become speculative? Is it going to be horror? Is it going to be a, a fantasy element? Like, I had no fucking idea. So every time things were going on, I was like, I don't know if I should be interpreting this as like mundane and what it seems. Or is this hinting at a thing that like is going to be like horrifying and speculative? I don't know. Anyway, I really, really enjoyed Dolores Claiborne. I really uh, liked it. And I thought it was another good example of Stephen King being a really good character writer, which is a thing that I don't think people talk about enough, maybe. I don't know. I don't really follow a lot of Stephen King discussion. So maybe people do talk about that. But like that, my very first Stephen King book was, was Pet Cemetery, And that was what struck me about it. I was like, this book is, you know, horrifying. And the, I, the ending was not great. But like, the thing that stuck out to me about Pet Cemetery that made me go, yeah, I definitely want to read more Stephen King was how good the character work was. Like the character of Lewis and what he's going through and how he thinks through things and just like following along on his journey throughout Pet Cemetery. I was like, this is excellent character work. And I haven't found that to be the case in all Stephen King that I've read, but my favorite Stephen King books are the ones that he, that, that shines. Um, and I think Dolores Claiborne is another example of that, where he's like come back to like doing character work really well. So it's not perfect, but I really, really enjoyed it. The first half more than the second half, but I also think that I, I wish I could have read it all in one sitting. It's pretty short. Um, I had like stuff going on the day that I started reading it. So like I couldn't, um, I had to like be somewhere that evening or something. I think I would have like liked the whole thing better if I'd been able to read it kind of start to finish in one day. But nevertheless, like I did really thoroughly enjoy it and would recommend it. Um, it's pretty harrowing. So I would look and don't go in blind like me. If you do have like triggers that you'd like want to avoid. I don't really have any that I'm aware of. So like there's stuff that I just like don't I'm not interested in, but I don't really have any triggers. So I feel comfortable going in blind. But if you have them like there is some pretty harrowing content in Dolores Claymore. So I would look that up if you're concerned, but otherwise go in blind. It's really good. <laughs> uh, next I read, reread The Cuckoo by Leo Carew, which is the third and final book in the Out of the Northern Sky series. This is my first time rereading it. I read it when it came out and haven't read it since. And this book is so good. It made like my top favorite books of the year, like when it came out and not just like made the list, but I think I named it my top favorite book of the year. Like with a pretty steep, like large margin. <laughs> yeah, it still holds up. It's still phenomenal. The amount that he just like crammed into this book, this is the longest book in the series. It doesn't like, I mean, it feels like it in terms of just how much happens in it, um, but it doesn't feel like long, you know, like it's absolutely like as short as it could possibly be and cram all of this in, but still is paced very well. It doesn't feel rushed. It's just such an amazing conclusion. Like I already loved the series. I didn't really think that he could do anything that would like make me dislike the series. I was like, but endings are, it's hard to stick the landing. I think he does stick the landing marvelously. Yeah, this is one of the best 
endings for a series that I've ever read and it's already a series that I just love to bits anyway and then to have the ending be so strong is just oh, so fucking good anyway yeah I highly recommend the series and people like my patrons have tended to agree that whether or not like some of them like the, like the entire series and some of them are iffy on the series but the ones that have read the entire thing whether they loved the series or thought it was okay have agreed that the cuckoo is really really good it's it's good it's good it's really good uh next up i read the london seance society by sarah penner which i talked about in my rant about cozy fantasy and that was the book that inspired that video i hated this and i talked a lot um, quite in depth about it in that video. That was the only book that I gave like full spoilers for. So I guess if you want to hear about it without spoilers, because I did go into spoilers for it for that video, um, I mean, don't read it. <laughs> it's a, uh, it's not a very interesting book. Like it's not very entertaining. It's um fantasy version of, you know, like London, what it, is it like Victorian or Regency? I think Victorian. 1873. Okay. But it's like, you know, seances and spiritualism is like real. And it like it, if its worst crime was just not being very well written and just being kind of dull, you know, fine, whatever. But in addition to being kind of dull and not very well written, it was also kind of offensive and kind of horrifying in what it considered to be like an okay thing to depict as not being bad. And that's kind of what made me want to make that video where it's like, okay, it's one thing to have characters do bad things or have characters do morally gray things. But if you have them do those things in a way where you don't have the narrative treated that way, where it's kind of treated quite casually and the book's tone isn't one of like dark comedy or something. Cause you know, like Deadpool does terrifying things, but like the tone of Deadpool is like a black comedy. But if a book like the London Seance Society, which is like cozy, magical girl power, you know, fights the patriarchy with spiritualism. Yeah. But then like the, the girl power heroine that you're supposed to be rooting for does kind of like villain stuff where you're like but it's not treated that way where you're like whatever you just did is way worse than the villain that you did it against ever did um like are we really presenting this like without questioning it like are people good with this we should not be good with this so it was boring and then also like yeah like I just, what <laughs> So yeah, do not recommend. The next book I read was The Mystery Guest, which is the second book in the Molly the Maid, I guess, trilogy. I think there's three now. So the first book I think is just called The Maid. Is it called The Maid? Yes, it's called The Maid. And I think there's going to be a third one that might be a Christmas one. Um, I really enjoyed The Maid. Um, I didn't actually know there was another one. So like I, I stumbled on this randomly. I was like, oh, there's another one. Um, and so I got it from the library. I definitely liked The Maid better, but I did enjoy The Mystery Guest. I just really enjoy the main character, Molly. Um, so I would definitely read more mysteries that are like about her and from this author. I think the author does a pretty good job of actually kind of writing something that I would kind of consider or classify as cozy, or at least it's cozy to me, um, because I find Molly to be such an endearing character. The mystery itself it was, I think, better in the first book. The mystery in this one, I mean, it was pretty obvious and also not that good. Um, it wasn't the worst mystery I've ever read. But the parts that I enjoyed in this second book were primarily like just kind of following Molly and her life and, you know, how she's piecing together her world, etc. The mystery itself, like, it was serviceable. But yeah, I just, I really enjoyed it. I like the um, author's authorial voice. I like the character of Molly. I liked some elements that were present in the mystery itself wasn't that good, but things to do with like the mystery setup. So like the places that the story necessarily has to take you to or like the environments we're in or the types of interactions that we have. Like some of it was just like, it was just like interesting to be in or fun to be in or whatever. So like the vibes were good, I guess. Um, yeah, so like definitely not like knock your socks off or anything. It wasn't like five stars, but it was pretty good. Definitely better than London Seance Society. I enjoyed it. It didn't demand much of me. It was a good time, would read more. Next I read, we actually <laughs> haven't talked about this with my patrons yet, but my patron um, book club book, uh, we're finally done with Under the Northern Sky. So our June book was The Tainted Cup by Robert Jackson Bennett, which I'd been wanting to read ever since I saw this cover <laughs> when it was announced. I was pretty excited that it won the poll to be the buddy read and I did not like it at all pretty much <laughs> not the worst thing that i've ever read like i said i haven't talked about it with my patrons yet we're talking about it this coming weekend um we usually talk the first like weekend of the month but i was um camping 
it was 109 degrees where I was camping. So I would have rather have been in my air conditioned apartment talking about this not great book, but that's neither here nor there. So this is, um, yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's not, it's not just people saying it, like the book itself comp uh, comps it to like Holmes and Watson, but it's like a fantasy story in a fantasy world. And it just, I don't think does anything very well. It doesn't do characters very well. It doesn't do plot very well. It doesn't do world building very well. It all feels extremely belabored and info dumpy and amateurish and dull and a slog to get through. And yeah, I, I've seen a lot of praise for this, which, you know, people like can like what they like, but this I don't think is well executed. If you enjoyed it, then, you know, I'm ha happy for you. But the thing that I've seen more so than anything else and cited as the reason people enjoy it is that they enjoy the main characters that are like kind of like the Holmes and Watson-esque characters, that they enjoy them individually and together and their dynamic. And I'm like, I truly do not understand. Like, I don't think character building is done like very well, if at all with them. Um, like that would have carried the story for me if like, cause I don't think the world building is done very well. And I don't think the mystery is done all that well, but if I had enjoyed their dynamic, cause like, that's why I watched Sherlock, the, um, the British TV show, like not, you know, the one with Benedict Cumberbatch and Martin Freeman, cause the mysteries in that are not very good. There's a fantastic video from H. Bomber guy about how the stories are garbage. And I completely agree with him, but I still watch and rewatch Sherlock all the time because I don't actually care about the mysteries because so rewatching it doesn't really matter because it's not like, oh, you already know who done it because I don't, the who done it of it is like neither here nor there. I just like their apartment and I like the like dynamic between Martin Freeman and Brennan Cumberbatch. Like I think like watching them perform those characters with each other is just really enjoyable, like their vibes together. And so like the story is not great, but I just like their their vibes, their dynamic. And so when people are talking about liking the vibes and dynamic between these characters, I'm like, I understand liking a book for that reason. And again, this story and this world building, I could have been like, not great, but sure did I love the vibes. Like I'm capable of that. What vibes? They were so amateurishly done, the, these characters. And there was just like so little to them as people. Like, I, I mean, I'm really happy for you if you enjoyed it, but I am not understanding or seeing it. I, and then next I read, <laughs> at long last, I did it, I did it, I did it. I read for my patrons for my vlog because they let me choose the book that I would vlog for them. So I chose Lightbringer by Pierce Brown. It's been a year. Has it been exactly a year? If not, if not exactly nearly exactly a year <laughs> since it came out. Finally read it and I was finally like in the right mood for it. Like I'm, I'm, I feel bad about not reading it like right when it came out because the whole read along thing. That's my bad. I own it. But like, I was not clearly in the headspace for it because I was like burnt out on the series after doing a read along and I just wasn't generally right in the right mood for it. But right now I just was. I was like, this is yes, like I am in the mood for this. And this is really good. This wasn't me like, oh man, I wish I'd read it sooner. I'm glad I read it when I did because it was the right time for it. So it hit exactly right. Um, this was phenomenal. And now I have to wait for Red God, just like everybody else. And I will get Alex and Angela to do a chat about this because we gotta finish this. <laughs> but yeah, I loved this. I'm sorry it took so long, but you know, anyway, yeah. Fantastic, fan freaking tastic. And then last but not least, I read Murder at the End of the World by Stuart Turton, which is the Blades and Bodice Rippers book club pick. And we have not had our meeting for that yet. Um, I read it early because I was able to get a skip the line copy from the library. And so I, I was like, oh, I'll just read it now. And um, so I don't really want to talk about it now yet because we haven't talked about it yet, but I did not like it very much. So yeah, I'll look forward to that. We will be dressing up again for Place and Bottom Surfers. It's Mara's pick, so the video will be on Mara's channel. Uh, the chat will be on Mara's channel. And uh, I look forward to dressing up. The book was, it's not it. So yeah, that's my wrap up. I did read some other books or for vlog projects, which I don't talk about until the vlog project is done. Those are all the books that I read that I can tell you. And yeah, I'll be back with another video soon. <laughs> Bye.